Hello and welcome to Rock Paper Shotgun, the RPS sessions coming to you live from EGX Res 2019. We are here at the show playing some of the demos available here for people who can't necessarily make it to Res so you can see all the exciting things on show. And one of the most exciting things here, of course, is Heaven's Vault, the latest game from Inkle. And we are joined by John from Inkle. Hello, Hi. John. Hello. And you are at Inkle. I'm the narrative, director, the narrative um, director and the writer. That's so oh, we that's all do a bit of everything because there's like seven of us and we're making massive great big 3d games but like writing is the thing that i want on my tombstone yes well and that's a very apt uh <laughs> well because uh, this game uh, is going to kill me it's very much about these <laughs> okay, things all right. <laughs> um we're just going to jump straight in this is the demo you've brought to um rest yep, and that's right. can you maybe just give us a little bit of sort of setup for you know what is this world that we're stepping into yeah right? okay so heaven's vault is a uh an archaeological narrative adventure game with an entire um, hieroglyphic language to decipher we in it. We down and into a narrow um, In it, you play this lady, Aaliyah el Azra, who with her robot assistant, Six, then we uh, sails from moon to moon through the nebula in which she lives, finding lost ancient sites and exploring them and trying to understand what they were and where they came from and who lived there and how they connect to places further in the past. So you're kind of uncovering deeper and deeper and deeper locations as you try to resolve a sort of core mystery at the heart of this place where you live. Um, so this demo here is, it's a super non-linear game, right? It's ridiculously non-linear. So this demo is either about 30% of the way through the game or possibly maybe 85% of the way through the game, or you might never see it in your game at all, ever. <laughs> um, and when you come here, you might not know what it is, or you might think it's completely the wrong thing, or you might think it's something else. Um, so in this particular setup, uh, you're pretty, you, you know what it is. You know what it is for this demo. So this is a place called the Withering Palace and she's heard a rumor of it and she doesn't know what it is. And here it is. And it's kind of the most exciting sight from this particular period that she's found. But what was it for, Matthew? That's the question. That's the question. That's, That's our aim. Question. Yeah. I've, well, I've, I, so I've been just to sort of full disclosure, I've been playing a bit of Heaven's Vault, the, the, the full game. The game yeah. So I have a kind of, uh, my idea of this world is probably slightly twisted through the route I've taken through it and the, you know, where I am in the central mystery and, what I'm trying to do, so I'm hopefully I'm, I'm not going to bring any of my weird prejudices yeah, <laughs> from so my version. To like this. It's a really weird thing to try and describe to people who haven't played it, but like one of the ideas of the game is that you, you make a lot of guesses about what places are or how things worked or what people were doing, and then they get fed back into the narrative, so the protagonist will change her opinion based on what you've figured out so far, which might come out of the translations like, like this one here, um, which means that you can play the game and have completely the wrong end of the stick about stuff, yeah, and not realise that you've got it. Mm. And like the game just adapts to that and copes with that. Um, yeah, so could you, could you tell us a bit more about this hieroglyphic sure, system and, yeah. and how, how we interact with it and, and what it like means? Yeah, right. So um, we were, it's a game about an archaeologist. So a core part of what archaeologists do that's awesome is translating hieroglyphs, obviously. Uh, we thought about actually translating hieroglyphs. We looked into it. Turns out it's quite a hard job. <laughs> really quite a skilled thing to do. Um, very hard to stick into a 10-hour video game. So we did the only sensible natural thing, and we created our own hieroglyphic language, which <laughs> is uh, optimized for video game play. <laughs> so um, this entire language is a genuine language. You can write anything in it. It has uh, these glyphs, which you can see. Each one represents some kind of concept or meaning or has some sort of uh, purpose in the words mm. that are built out of these glyphs. Um, we never tell you what the glyphs mean, but as you start to see more and more examples of the script, you can come up with ideas for what they might mean, and that will help you choose your translations. So this is the first one we've seen in our gameplay. So it's given us a fairly simple phrase to look at. It's on a gate, so that gives us a clue as to what it might be. We've been already told it's possibly an empire site, so that might be a useful piece of information. Might not be. Um, so then you guess, and whatever you guess from the options available uh, will yeah. be will be fed back into the dialogue, and then that will inform what happens in the next in the story. So you're going with Emperor's Gate. I am going with Emperor's Extremely Gate. Extremely yeah. literal. Okay. <laughs> So so that she's saying, okay, right, this does suggest that this genuinely is an empire site. So she's considering this evidence. Mm. Can you also tell us a little bit about this, the timeline? Yeah, sure. Is it, shall I go into the... Yeah, yeah, if you just um, hit the... Oh. the what is it on the control? It's the options button or the escape yeah. key. Um, there you go. Yeah, yeah so uh, this is something I, th I, I, you know, from the, what I've played of it is it's one of the craziest game features I think I've ever seen. This is a timeline of this world, yeah. but incredibly granular. Yeah, I think you need to zoom fully out to really, and then yeah. zoom fully in to really demonstrate what it's doing. Um, 
So the timeline stretches back for, I think it's four and a half, five thousand years and covers the entire history of the nebula's civilization. It's yeah. full of what you know, and as you change your opinions and theories in the game, it'll update to reflect what you currently believe. But it also includes literally everything that happened in the nebula, <laughs> including everything that you've done in your game. So that marker on the right there, that's what you just did, and it was just under a minute ago. <laughs> and if you scroll back through this, though actually in the demo it will be missing some things because we have skipped ahead a bit. It'll show things like the beginning of the plot and what happened when uh, Aaliyah was born or a bit of information about when she was growing up. But then it'll also say you know, what happened four and a half thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago, 500 years ago, what happened on the moon, Iox, what happened, you know, mm. all, all of history is here, both in little and, and big format. And you can zoom in and out of it fluidly and uh, cross-reference it as well. So if you go into one of these events, so here's the founding of the Iox Protectorate. Um, so if you flip along to another one, just let's keep looking around. Oops, if you go back, if you pick that one, no, pick the goddess, there we go. So obviously the goddess is a god, and there's actually a whole category of gods. So if you use oh, the bumpers, what, yeah. you can change your categories and look at everything you know about gods, or everything you know about Maerzi, which is one of the moons, or everything you know about, and whatever. You can kind of jump around. So it's sort of Wikipedia-ish, right? Yeah. You can jump around the history of the nebula as much as you like. I've just, and, I've um, just never seen a feature like this before in this much detail <laughs> where you're really filling it in. Like, and can, I know, in theory, I is everything in this timeline true? No. Um, you'll see that a few of them have question marks oh, at the moment. Right, that literally means this is a theory that I have. Theories can get confirmed. She yeah. can get enough evidence that she goes, yeah, I'm absolutely certain of this. A lot of them won't be. That's just what being an archaeologist is like. Yeah. Like a lot of it is theory and, and guesswork. And one thing I really like is that by the end of the game, you can get to a point where you have directly contradictory things on <laughs> your timeline. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about that. That's just what well, we don't know. Right, like we've always yeah. said being an archaeologist is a bit like being a detective, except you turn up really late and the murderer never, ever confesses. And <laughs> yeah. that's, that's just them's the breaks. That's what you've got. Um, <laughs> So I kind of, I, I love that sort of sense of ambiguity and not quite being sure. And But the other thing is, like, a lot of the time when you talk to people who've played the game, they'll say, yeah, okay, Aaliyah hasn't confirmed this, but I'm absolutely certain of this. I know this. People mm. get really attached to ideas, and there's nothing to stop you doing that. So it's um, the same with the, the, the language. That there, there are, there are the moments gate. where the wind outside uh, symbols dropped. are kind of confirmed, Some or someone yeah. will say, oh, it's that, and... We can take that at face value. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the the language game lets you choose options and kind of make ideas for other translations based off earlier translations. But we don't really want people to just end up in this massive confusion of confusionness yeah. because that's not actually fun. So um, I, it, I, f I find that very satisfying when you've made some guesses based on the ideas you have, and then you show it to another academic, and they're like. Oh yeah, that's definitely yeah, the yeah, word you've for got water. That like you're really yeah, spot yeah, on there. Exactly. Or they're like, oh no no, that, that isn't a, that isn't a door, you yes, know. And you're exactly. like, oh, you just yeah. feel like such an idiot because you're like, oh, I've built everything on the the <laughs> idea that that was door. So yeah, no, it, it's been it you know it, it's a funny thing. People say, well, isn't that quite frustrating to play? And you think, well, maybe, but like we balanced it. Like, and it is just a balancing problem mm. from a game design point of view. You need it to be. Like hard enough that you you can't just walk through translations getting told the, the answers, and, and safe and enough that you can't just books. destroy your game state with all rubbish guesses. Yeah, and, and I think we found a midpoint that really really works. Um, but it definitely has. I think if it, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, when when you when you were sh you know I saw this last year at Res, and it, yep. you know it was this sort of. Um, you know, you're looking around and you're deciphering these dead, these sort of dead sites, as it were, and kind of unpicking what they are. But it really is a game that's quite alive with characters and mysteries. And there is, I think, maybe some people might be surprised by yeah. that based on yeah, yeah. some yeah. of the earlier things you said about the game. Oh, exactly. So when we were building the game out, we made one of these empty levels first, one of these ruined sites, but mainly because they were the hardest to make fun. Because mm. what do you do on an archaeological site? What's the point? Like, yeah. why, why does it matter? So you know, we spent a while working on that, really getting to a point where we were happy with that. Um, but the archaeology sits within a a proper story. Like, yeah, there are characters, there are people she has relationships with. Those relationships can go good or bad or wrong or indifferent or whatever. And some of the places that you go to in the game are really quite busy. You know, there's a lot of people. Mm. There's a lot of stuff going on, and that 
idea of making a story, you know, it was core in 80 days, it was core in sorcery, it's still core mm. now. We don't want to make a loneliness simulator. We don't want to make a game that's just about wandering around on your own because we don't have to. We can make a game where you get to talk to people and like crack jokes and yeah. have excitement and drama and all that stuff as well as doing the archaeology. Yes. Um, I th yeah, and that, that was another thing I thought the, um, you know, obviously there's this idea of, of your translations creating this like branching understanding of what the world means. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's classic ink, or that's, you know, you'll take the game in the root. But then on top of that, there is the core, like, narrative layer of who do you, you know, yeah. work with, who do you aid, who do you lie to. Yeah. Yeah, there's, a lot yeah, of, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of branching in, in, in that uh, It's just that that's my favourite thing in the whole world, is making characters in games that you can lie to, or who lie to you. And then they turn around and they say, I'm sorry, I was lying to you. And you go, oh, <laughs> like, yeah, it, yeah. that's... That to me is the whole thing. It's like it's about these connections. You know, when you're exploring these sites, you've got your robot sidekick, so you've always got someone to talk to. There's always a character there. You have an ongoing relationship with your robot that develops based on how you talk to it. Mm. You know, they can end up very, very friendly and they can end up very, very antagonistic with each other. And there are some more drastic endings in there as well that oh. I won't spoil. Um, but like, and it is a robot and it's a robot in order to make that, person that you're with the whole time really robust and resilient to you and a good sidekick you know mm. without being too confusing but there are moons you can go to with other characters in the game and you know there are people you can take with you and there are lots of different combinations it, depending on what plot threads you follow it's just it's it's good it's good it's all this stuff you've got to <laughs> tell your stories you've got to get your people in and tell stories yeah Otherwise it doesn't matter I, I i think one of the something we were talking about just before we started the stream i think one of the really interesting tensions in the game as well is is the kind of sharing of knowledge and the furthering of knowledge because you're playing this academic yeah. you kind of head back to this university where there are other academics who have maybe uh, like agendas tied to their culture that they're from or the university that they're part of and there's this real tension about like how much you tell them about what you've seen out in the world yeah. and you know there's characters who who can help you translate things or you can show them items and they might you know give you f advice but then at the same time they'll then say well and give it to me and i'll put it in the university and there becomes this big kind of yeah, quite moral dilemma of who should of, be looking of, after of, of this like stuff. what you do with, yeah. with history i mean I just think, i mean that like before we started the game we we read up and we researched about archaeologists and that is just one of the core problems of archaeology is what do you do with this stuff once you found it you know mm. you go looking for it and it's there and that's great but then if you're in a war-torn country or if you're in a country where the government is extremely corrupt do you really want to give it to that government mm. but do you have any right to take it away from that government well you probably don't but you've got to do something you can't just bury it again yeah so this is a you know this is a real genuine problem and i think no one has good solutions to it and you know we didn't want to make a game which just said well you should always do this because actually there is no this that you should always do. Mm -hmm. And there are occasions in the game where you can sell artifacts that you found in order to get clues to find other things. And we're going to let you do that. We're not going to punish you directly for it, right. even though it's probably ethically not very sound. <laughs> yeah. um, because I think we need to make a space where players explore this stuff and just get a sense of the scope of, of what they're doing. Mm. Um, I think that's really interesting. I think that's really meaty stuff um, mm. to be getting on with. Oops, don't touch the mic. <laughs> um, 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 what about the actual kind of cr creation of the creation of the world? Because that's um, the one. Of, you know, uh, as we sort of said before, you know, there's there's this sort of surprise at how much life there is in this game about history. But at the same time, you're trying to decipher, you know, what made these places tick. But you're also trying to learn about, you know, this quite abstract, not quite not abstract, but quite far out setting as well. Yeah. I mean, can you talk a bit more about the sort of the, the nebula and, and kind of where that came from. Yeah, so the nebula has been um, uh, the nebula has been my problem child for the last <laughs> like four years. It has been so hard to build this down. world and make mm. it make sense. We started with this visual idea of, of rivers flowing through first. space. We wanted space to be beautiful and like a natural landscape, not an empty void, but somewhere mm. kind of that felt like a more or more like a fantastical version of space. But at the same time, we wanted it to make coherent, logical, physical sense. Mm. So we started with this problem of how does this nebula come to exist and why is it like it is? Mm. And how does this way of living on moons separated by rivers that are unidirectional, how does that change the people who live there? How does that change who's in charge? How do they distribute food? You know, who, who, mm. who is the boss of this situation? Um, and kind of getting all of those problems to resolve themselves into a way that made sense to build this world uh, was 
yeah, it was ridiculously difficult. And then there were, we had to have 5,000 years worth of history because we couldn't just say, well, it's just like this. Because then you'd say, well, how did it get to be like that? Because it was actually relevant. We need to build a site which tells the player this is how it got to be the way it did. But we got there in the end. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I love it as a world. This is one of the hardest things for me now because we've finished this game. We have shipped it to reviewers. It comes out on the 16th, you know, two weeks time. I really can't write any more for it now. Yeah. <laughs> like, I still find myself going, well, I could just maybe just, but I really mustn't. But there are so many stories that I could tell now because I actually do, I, I, I understand it. I yeah. really do, you know? What, what was um, that like as a process? Because, you know, in your previous works, you know, were, you know were, were both both uh, sorcery and 80 days based on pre existing yeah. universes. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, you know, you, you, you guys brought a, a huge amount to them of your, of, your, of your own ideas and your own stuff, but... No, it is definitely true. It is way easier to bring stuff to an existing IP than yeah. it is to make it one from scratch. Like, just a million billion times easier. Like, making 80 Days was just like having a party at your parents' house. You just <laughs> throw stuff around, you do whatever you like, yeah. you just make a mess of it, but if you need cutlery, there's cutlery. Yeah, um, yeah. Building this game is like having a party in the middle of a field. And you've got nothing. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, well, I... Um, um, <laughs> I, I think when we started, Joe, who's my, my co-founder at Inkle, um, we started it together. He said, you know, we should really make our own IP. We've never done that. It would be interesting. And I was like, no, it will be hard. It will be <laughs> really, really hard. <laughs> and there's this fear when you're doing it that people might not like, like, one thing. And then your whole game is bust. They might just say, I don't like robots that look like that. And yeah, right. Go, oh, um, right. Okay. Well, we can't. So, yeah, yeah it, it was hard work but it was incredibly satisfying kind of there were a couple of moments where just you'd have a sudden realization about how something worked and then everything makes sense and yeah. that's super exciting yeah I, th I think from a from a, definitely from a, say from a player's perspective from my perspective i think there is something quite thrilling about throwing yourself into a world which you know absolutely nothing about and then it being absolutely vast in terms of its ideas like <laughs> this is uh, like uh, that's yeah. what i mean the scale of it is yeah. so much bigger than I thought it was going to be, you know, the history of it. I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's a really weird comparison, but like, you know, it's the kind of thing that I, you don't really see much outside of like, you know, your, your Mass Effects, your Dragon yeah. Ages, yeah, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of like, yeah. where there's a vast... I, I, I was I was thinking a lot about The Witcher when, oh, when okay. writing this out, actually, The Witcher 3, just the kind of the level of world building in that game and just thinking, well, I, you know, we're seven people, but just trying to approach that kind of sense of, every bit of depth having a bit of depth behind it like because mm. the, the witcher everything goes a couple of levels deep like they, there's a reason behind a reason behind everything yeah. and like that's just really satisfying from a player's point of view and if you don't care about it, it's fine mm. just enjoy the story it all makes sense there aren't any plot holes it's great and if you want to dig into it you can really get to grips with that world and yeah. i love that about it and yeah, I kind of wanted to try and do that here. And we had the time to do it, which was the nice thing. Yeah. And how long have you guys been working on this? This has been four years. Four years, wow. It's been two and a half years in full production. That's since we shipped Sorcery 4 that we really kind of went for it. But the year and a half before that, we were prototyping, building up the world, designing the characters, and starting to kind of understand just how the game worked, and what, you know, what the buttons do, because this yeah. has all been new to us. Um, and it's funny because now it plays basically like an Uncharted game. Like you drive it around and move the, yeah, the thumbstick. It's pretty straightforward, actually. Yeah. But like we went through a lot of versions to get here. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So and and uh, you know, with all the branching and everything, you know, you, you sort of see this as something that people can replay and see different endings and. So I'm always worried about endings, right? Because like no, it's a bit crude. To I don't it down even to know. Boil it down to uh, you know, as if that's yeah. the, well, the, the, all the thing, end. But like all. when you <laughs> get to the end, like where does the ending start becoming the ending? I don't even know. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because there isn't like a big final page of text, and you get to pick one of three of them. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes, anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I this game isn't built for replay in the same way that 80 Days was. Right. right like okay. 80 play, days, you can play seven or eight times and get a completely different adventure every yeah. time, and that's that's about the right number. This is probably something that people who like it are going to play twice, maybe three times, mm. and be able to see new things and new variations of things and try out different strategies and explore different bits of the plot and still have a great time. Um, we we kind of try to make that better we've got a new game plus mode which i'm super excited oh, about because right. it's really just a really neat little thing um so as you're exploring the game right you find translations when you find a translation the translation that you get is very slightly procedurally um, adjusted to make sure that it makes sense it, you know if it's on a door it's about being a door or whatever 
but it's also um, suitable to what you know, right. to how much language you've got. Because it's non-linear, we need to give you easy ones to start with and hard ones towards the end, but yeah. we don't oh, know when the level is going to come. New Game Plus, you start the game, you keep the entire dictionary the that you've got at the end of the first playthrough, keep and every single translation in the game levels itself long. up. So the oh. first uh, translation you get, which was like the one word one that you started yes. with, is suddenly five words long. And that goes for everything. Oh, right. And of course, longer translations means more content, means more lore, means more secrets, means more discoveries. Like suddenly you're going to read these things oh, and fantastic. really understand details that you couldn't see the yeah. first time round, and the game supports that really really well oh, that's and cool. so we have a couple of beta testers who've been playing for like over a hundred hours now they're on their third new game plus plus mode <laughs> yeah. then the, the the translation expressions they're coming out with are just in they're, they're absurd yeah. <laughs> these <laughs> enormous things but they can kind of read them how did you make um, this game without going mad i have gone mad repeatedly oh, and we, we all have <laughs> Um, I think for a long time we really didn't think this game was ever going to actually get finished. Right. Because it just felt like every everything we did had another problem inside it, had another one inside it. Right. But somehow, I guess things come together. Yeah, it came together. Um, oh, that's that's wonderful. I've, I'm fine. We actually have to wrap things up here, so I'm not going to be able to solve the mystery of this area. Well, also, I want to do it in my own game at home, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, where I can enjoy things. Well, the great thing is when you come to this level, all the translations will be completely yeah, different. Yeah, I guarantee so, that. Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining oh, us and talking us through the game. I, I really think it's one of a kind. Uh, I think it's a absolutely like fascinating evolution of what you guys have been doing in the past. Thank I think you. it deals with some really interesting stuff. Um, it's yeah. so nice to be starting to be able to talk to people about <laughs> the content <laughs> yeah. in the game. Like after all this time, now finally I can sort of say, oh, what did you think of the guy in the... Yeah, yeah I'm really looking forward and to that. And when, when can people at home play this? So this is out on April the 16th, which is Tuesday week, and it's on Steam, and it'll be on PS4 as well. Excellent um, stuff. Not sure of the release time yet. You can wish list it now if you want to. Fantastic. And can they follow you on Twitter? Yeah, please do. Um, my personal Twitter is at John Ingold, and the studio is at Inkle Studios, and the game is at Heaven's Vault. So choose what you're interested <laughs> in. <laughs> yes. And thank you again. And thank you for joining us on the RPS sessions. Uh, we will be back in about 10 minutes with, I think, Snooker 18, uh, 19, Snooker 19. Uh, so please do join us for that. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You.